I won't take up too much of your time, but uh, but I did check out your documentary, Black Holes: The Edge of All We Know. Great. So uh, so once again, uh, congratulations for another successful documentary uh, for yourself. Thank you. I appreciate that. So what uh, what actually sparked you to uh, do this documentary for uh, the um, Black Holes? Well, about six years, seven years ago, six years ago, I began a center for the study of, of black holes with five colleagues. And the six of us came from all different fields. And we was combining physics, astrophysics, mathematics, a philosophy, history, all focused like a laser on this, these extreme objects, these very strange entities that are like nothing else in the known universe. So, and it's even by itself, that's amazing that mathematicians are interested in it, that physicists are interested in it, that philosophers ask questions about what does it mean for time to go backwards at this core of a spinning black hole. And um, so we started this project and part of it was associated with a worldwide effort to make an image of a black hole. And another part was exploring this question that Stephen Hawking had visited upon the world of saying that black holes do something in physics that nothing else does. Every other part of physics, if you know what the present is, you can predict the future and you can predict the past. But black holes bear no trace of how they were made. So even if you know where they are, all of the information about how they were made is lost. So I made this, I decided to make a film about these projects as they went along. And I didn't know how it would come out. It was a big risk. You know, it could have been we didn't find an image. It could be that we couldn't resolve this problem of uh, Hawking's information lost paradox. But I thought it would be really interesting to see science in motion, science being made, not science, here's the answer and how you could understand it more easily, but to look at it with all the ups and downs and twists and turns that real science demands. So that's why I, be, I began shooting in, 19, in 2015, 2016, and then finished, you know, maybe five years later. So it was a long process. So who, who, how did you choose the subjects uh, for, your, uh, for your documentary? Are these, are these folks the who's who's of the scientists around the black hole? Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, Andy Strominger was one of the people who... Uh, is an old friend of mine, and he was one of the people that we started this black hole initiative with, this this center. Um, and he had been working with Stephen Hawking and the rest of that team, Malcolm Perry from Cambridge, England, and a, a young graduate student, or then graduate student, Sasha Hako. She was just uh, in the midst of her thesis work. And on the other side, um, Shep Doleman, who was the uh, then the director of this Event Horizon Telescope collaboration was also one of the people who started this center. But the collaboration of the, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration spanned the world. There were um, more than 200 people involved in, 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 in dozens of institutes in many, many countries. You needed to have a worldwide collaboration in order to make a telescope that could see something so distant and so small on the sky. So was it easy to convince your subjects uh, to, uh, to participate in this documentary? Because uh, they, they, seem, they seem very friendly. They seem uh, eager to talk about this. <laughs> well, I think it's true. This is an area that um, people are excited about. And the people that work in it are as fascinated by the strangeness of these beasts as everyone else. So uh, I think that infectious excitement was definitely there. Many of these people are friends who I work with all the time. I'm a member of the Black Hole of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So I, was, I worked with these people day in, day out. And I think that, um, you know, there may have been at the beginning, people were a bit shy about having a camera there, but soon you just get used to it. And um, the people who are in the film quite like it. <laughs> and so I'm happy about that. They feel that they were accurately represented. I wish I could have represented everybody on the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. But if I had had 
equal time for 200 people, it would have been weeks to watch the film. Uh, it would have been impossible. So I had to choose people who were doing things that were quite central, but also who were able to communicate well on camera. And you know, there are many things that had to come together. Now you're a, you you are a professor um, what of uh, physics, physics and history of science are my main areas, and I sometimes teach some filmmaking. So how how what was it like to be a fly on the wall, you know, watching this unfold, without uh, giving your own two cents into this? Well, you know, sometimes there were difficult moments where I had to sort of. I, some, some of it I filmed myself and some of them I had a cinematographer filming, but there were times when I wanted to intervene. And so I had, I had to put on one hat and take off another. So that could be complicated on um, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. But it was, uh, and there were moments when it was really thrilling uh, to, to, you know, to see the first image of a black hole emerge on the screen. Um, we know we kept it a secret that we'd had, we found this image for almost a year because we wanted to make really sure that the image was here to stay and wasn't an artifact of how we were processing the data or something else. And so when we finally could tell people, show people, it suddenly became the most widely seen image in the history of science. A billion people saw it in the first day or two. And before that, it had been the secret that we didn't even tell our fam we didn't even show to our families. We didn't tell them anything. So it was really uh, that was a thrilling moment as well. Now that that part of uh, <clears throat> trying to keep the black hole as a secret for an entire year was part of your documentary. What 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 did it struck a nerve that they were trying to keep this a secret when you're trying to film a documentary, or they knew eventually they have to. Uh, reveal this? Well, we wanted to reveal it. We just wanted to not make a mistake. You know, we wanted, we wanted to be confident that the image was robust, that it was here to stay. And if we, you know, if we showed one image and then we said, well, no, it's, that's not exactly right. We have to fix it in this way. And no, no, that's not exactly right. Then nobody would have known what to believe. So we had to satisfy ourselves uh, that this was a reliable image. And, you know, filming it, um, you know, I, every, you know, anybody that was involved in, on the film side had to agree uh, not to disclose anything they saw or heard during the, during the time we were filming, because it really, it really required that we work it out. And then when we were confident, then we would show the world and we published the data and we gave, you know, conferences, press conferences and interviews. And we, it, we could really talk about it and that was exciting, but we, we had to get to that point. It was nerve wracking. <laughs> Excellent. Now, um, you know, for those people who don't understand, there was like what, it was like an information loss paradox. So basically what, what this entire documentary that they're trying to solve is because information wasn't coming out of the black hole because it was just all stuck in, in there. Is, it, is, that, is that what the interpretation for a normal person should, should understand? Yeah, that's right? right. The information loss paradox that Stephen Hawking showed us in 1974 was that, you know, if you burn a piece of paper, practically speaking, you can't get the information back. But in principle, you, if you were a super de duper computer, you could figure out where each grain, each bit of ash came from, and you could reconstruct it. Imagine having a um, movie of a, a flame burning a paper, and then you played it backwards. So you could imagine each of those ashes sort of recombining. So in principle, physics should be able to be played backwards. You should be able to predict the way things were made. I could take this computer I'm looking at and I could see the traces of it, knowing the laws of physics and figure out how it was composed. But black holes are not like that. And what Stephen Hawking noticed or deduced in 1974 was that black holes, you can't tell, you can tell how massive they are, how big they are and if they're spinning, but you can't tell whether they were made of 
giraffes or typewriters or desks or other stars. You can't tell anything about how they were made. And he said, this, is, this presents a real problem for us physicists who want to believe that if we know the true laws of physics, that we could reconstruct how things got to be the way they are. And so how was the, how did this event horizon telescope supposed to work? Because it's telescopes all around the world. So is it just monitoring this black hole 24, 24 hours in different angles and just trying to gather whatever data that comes out and then just to form one image? So if you had a telescope, this, this little tiny telescope, and you looked through it, you can only get a certain amount of magnification. And, you know, you get a bigger telescope, you get more light, but also more magnification. And the big telescopes, I've seen pictures of them on the tops of mountains, the big optical telescopes, have enormous mirrors on them that collect the light and help magnify the image. So we know, roughly speaking, how big these black holes are. We know, roughly speaking, how far away they are. These, these are supermassive black holes, millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. Um, but there's this one that we made an image of is so far away, 55 million light years away. That means they were, the light that started out that we're seeing now was launched from around the black hole not that long after dinos, the last dinosaur laid his, his head down and died. So this is a long time ago. And if but it's tiny on the sky. It's like trying to read a, the date on a coin in Mexico City from New York. I mean, it's just, or looking at an atom that's held out at the end of your fingers. It's a tiny image on the sky. So you need it. You could calculate how big a telescope do you need to do that? Well, it turns out you need something that's roughly speaking the size of the earth. Mm. Well, we can't build a telescope the size of the earth. But what we can do is to take existing telescopes that are all around the Earth and pretend that they're parts of a giant mirror, synchronizing them perfectly. So they act like shards of a mirror distributed over the Earth. And with that amount of amplification of the image, we can actually hope to see something this tiny size on the sky. Wow. Well, that's a that that was some quite a, of a venture that you that you actually have uh, for the past uh, five five years. Now, you you were fortunate enough to actually include uh, Stephen Hawking into into the documentary. I mean, he's a he's a hero to the science community. How how was that uh, to you? And um, I also noticed that uh, you didn't really had a chance to interview him. Yeah, you know, for for. for what Stephen had to do to answer a question, I mean, sometimes this is hard to tell when you have heard or see him giving a speech, those have to be pre prepared laboriously and each word has to be composed using tiny movements of, in, in his face. And so I wasn't trying to interview him so much as to show Stephen Hawking working you know, and asking questions and interacting because we've seen Stephen Hawking as such an icon that we, but we've never had a chance to see that. It's like Einstein. You know, we have lots of pictures of Einstein waving to crowds or movie, movie you know, movie clips that were shown on newsreels that show Einstein arriving in New York or, uh, you know, in walking in Princeton or whatever it was, but there's never been anything filmed of, of Einstein actually doing physics, what he was famous for. We just saw him being famous. And in a way, I wanted to capture that side of Stephen Hawking. I mean, I, there were times when I would talk to him and, you know, I asked him once um, what he, you know, when he thought the black hole idea really got formulated. And he said, well, he said, J. Robert Oppenheimer really discovered black holes too bad about the bomb, the atomic bomb. You know, so he, he would compress like a whole story into just a few words and he had to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, that's how he did his physics too. He would just ask that perfect question that would push understanding farther or encourage one line of inquiry. He wasn't gonna cover pages and pages with calculations. It would just be hopelessly laborious. So he, he had to picture what was going on and grasp it in its 
totality and then ask a trenchant question or make a suggestion. Well, thank you uh, for humanizing uh, Stephen Hawking for many of us who don't know him or have never or will uh, meet him, obviously. And it was a great loss. You know, he died during the making of this film. And I mean, during the time I was making the film and he, you know, I think everybody who knew him and worked with him just, you know, admired not only his observations and insight, but his humanity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let, let me wrap it up with one more question. I've taken a lot of your time already, uh, Peter. When people have a chance to view your uh, documentary, what is the one most important take that you hope that they would walk away with? I'd like people to see how collaborative science is, how in order for science to work productively, whether it's theory on the side of the work with Hawking, or whether it's a giant observational effort that had hundreds of people. These only work because people can coordinate their efforts, can, can pull in the same direction. And I think that in many ways, even beyond science, our hope of dealing with the great challenges of our time, whether it's COVID and the pandemic that the world has now to face or climate change, these are efforts that are gonna require worldwide collaboration. And the, all the skills of different people with different backgrounds and different skill sets. And I, I, I hope that people see in this film that science isn't just the musings of an individual late at night. It's really this cooperative effort to accomplish something more than any single person could hope to do. Excellent. Well, Peter, hey, thank you uh, for this conversation. This documentary is going to help me... Uh, better understand these Stephen Hawking books that I have playing around the house. <laughs> That's great. And if people want to see it, you can look at the website blackholefilm.com. And um, I look, when is, when is your piece going to uh, run? Probably this week, yes. Great. Well, thank you very much for making the time to talk with me. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, time. Bye.